questions were raised why a talk or a session one hour session on heart failure in a predominantly diabetology meeting and uh, i was uh, we were just going through our audits of this year and when we audited the patients who had acute myocardial infarction what we found that more than 80% of the patients had diabetes and when we audited the patients with heart failure more than 90% of the patients had diabetes and we all know the not so new dictum or the rule that about 70 to 80% of diabetics die of heart disease but the common thought process a common paradigm what people think is that uh, diabetes is a coronary equivalent or heart attack equivalent as a half news paper way back in 19 late 90s 96 and even when i asked my registrars or fellows uh, what is the commonest cause of death in diabetics invariably the answer would be acute mi but we have to understand that heart failure is becoming more common and it is more lethal than acute mi for example somebody who comes with an mi in india there have been registry data and their one year survival or one year mortality would be around 5% there have been some registries which showed that uh, like one year uh, five year survival was 7.5% but we can say around 10.5 to 10% is the one year mortality but one year mortality with heart failure is about 30% three times more or more so we have to know about it because the most of our patients if especially with the diabetic background will die of heart disease and it may not be mi it may be the post mi sequela and heart failure which is the cause of uh, this mortality and we now we have to move away from this siloed or compartmentalized approach and now is the time for metabolic cardiac renal medicine or where all the specialties shake hands with each other and strive together for the benefit of the patient so for that uh, we have chosen today for this panel meeting the the topic is uh, the topic is the latest uh, heart failure guidelines from the esc and it's very important we have to diagnose and manage and with that for that we have uh two of very eminent colleagues or 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 specialists in the field dr kohli is from delhi is a gold medalist and he uh, mixes the unique uh, features of experience expertise and clinical excellence so uh, experience expertise and excellence are three e's and uh, he is a internal medicine specialist and he will give us the perspective from internal medicine point of view and from endocrine endocrine point of view we have altamar shake who is a very dynamic endocrinologist from mumbai with multiple kudos on his credit academic uh, so the the agenda would be i would say few uh, uh, i would say few introductory sentences and all the panelists have been kind enough to share the slides with me so to save time i would be a ask uh, there are certain questions there are seven burning questions and i would uh, ask each of them and i would share the slide so that the sharing that time can be saved so the topic for today is impact of esc 2021 guideline on diagnosis and managing heart failure with reduced ejection fraction this came in august 2021 and why is this so important because health professionals as i said should move out of their silos and we have to help our patients because the most diabetics die of cardiac related problems most of these problems uh, may not be the acute mi the survival after mi is quite good but heart failure the survival is still very bleak and it is worse than most cancers so these guidelines guidelines keep on changing there is a universal uh, uh, diagnosis of heart failure 
the American one is coming soon, but Canadian ones are there. But European guidelines uh, are is arguably the most balanced of the guidelines. And most of the Indian guidelines are very similar to European guidelines. So these guidelines focus on the diagnosis and management. And uh, they look at the, the latest available data and all the experts are signed. There is no the disparity or incongruity. And uh, there are many new concepts. And uh, the, the, the new concepts included a change of the term mid-range to mildly reduced, new simplified treatment algorithm, addition of a treatment algorithm according to phenotypes, modified classification acute, uh, uh, for acute heart failure, updated treatment for more, most non-cardiovascular comorbidities, including diabetes, and this is mostly a diabetic meeting, so it's very important, and something about genetic testing and key quality indicators. That's also very important. So for a quality indicator for a, for a primary care physician is broadly it's the quantity of life, quality of life of both. The patient says that I am miserable, but my sugars are controlled. It doesn't mean a thing either for the patient as well as the doctor. And vice versa, if the, as a cardiologist, I say I don't have angioplasty, the stents are fine, I take the medicine, but the patient is miserable, or the sugars are not well controlled, then again, the quality indicator, the quality of life indicator is important. So these are the plans. So there are about, we have selected about seven key questions, and uh, the seven key questions uh, include, uh, what are the key steps to the diagnosis of heart failure, Diagnostic algorithm and T-Pro BNP, challenges in diagnosing, what is the general principles, patient without diabetes, which therapies are recommended, because that is very important again. And uh, with patient with therapy or diabetes, what are the heart failure therapies recommended? What would be your recommendation in view of ACC 2021 guideline and ACC 21 guidelines? All this will be discussed. So my First question to Dr. Kohli is, what are the key steps in the diagnosis of heart failure? So I would share the slides. Dr. Kohli, welcome, and thank you for joining in this very, very important session. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, dear friends. So they have aptly chosen a physician to talk about the initial diagnosis of heart failure, because it is often the physician who is approached by a patient of breathlessness. And most of the diabetics are also seen by a physician rather than an endocrinologist. So I think we should be trained in the diagnosis of heart failure because missing a diagnosis of heart failure can prove disastrous for the patient. As is already, our chairperson has already pointed out, the mortality is so high even with treatment. 50% of the patients of heart failure failure die within five years and it we should not forget that it is not the myocardial infarction which is the first manifestation cardiovascular manifestation in a diabetes but it is the heart failure so we should be trained and we should train ourselves to be able to diagnose can you go to the previous slide please yes so as with any other disease the first step in the diagnosis of any disease are symptoms and examination are signs. But here, the problem with heart failure is most of the symptoms of heart failure are shared by other diseases, especially the pulmonary diseases. So there may not be any specific symptom in case of heart failure apart from breathlessness. And signs are also harder to detect because signs like elevated JVP and displacement of the apical impulse they are specific, but they are harder to detect. So we may miss the diagnosis when we rely purely on symptoms and signs. So we have to take the help of various investigations to be able to heart failure. Next slide, please. So, so coming to the classical symptoms in a heart failure. So these are the three classical symptoms, which are breathlessness, fatigue, and swelling of the ankles. 
because of the water retention. But they alone are not sufficient to make the diagnosis of heart failure because they can be seen in many other diseases. Next, we'll see a group of typical symptoms in heart failure patients, and we are all aware of it, breathlessness, and especially orthopnea. When the patient lies down, he feels more breathless. Then history of paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. So orthopnea and PND point towards a diagnosis of heart failure. Then patient gets tired easily. So there is a decreased exercise tolerance and he feels fatigued very easily. And there is swelling of the ankles. Less typically, you may get cough at night. There may be little wheezing, loss of appetite, palpitations or syncopal attacks. Regarding the sign on examination, you may find elevated JVP, there is a hepatojugular reflux. You may hear a third heart sound and there is laterally placed apical impulse. Apart from that, you may find both weight gain because of the water retention or even cachexia because of the <laughs> tissue wasting. And you may see some murmur and peripheral uh, edema and chest examination may reveal crepitations and pleural fusion. And there is tachycardia and tachypnea. Apart from that, in severe cases, you may find hepatomegaly and ascites. Next, please. So, apart from these signs and symptoms, I told you we have to take the help of certain tests. And the most important simple test available in our practice is an electrocardiogram or ECG. Usually, ECG will show some changes in cases of heart failure. And these changes may be changes of, of ischemia, changes of LVH, and changes of arrhythmia. But you may also require the help of natriuretic peptides in the diagnosis of heart failure if they are available. So a plasma concentration of BNP less than 35 picogram or anti-pro-BNP -pro less than 125 or MR pro ANP less than 40 makes a diagnosis of heart failure unlikely. So you can rule out at heart failure by measuring natriuretic peptides. Then apart from these two tests, we have to do some basic investigations and very important and don't forget hemoglobin. If the patient is anemic, he is more likely to go into heart failure, then kidney function tests, urea, creatine and electrolytes. Then we have to also rule out any hepatic involvement and thyroid function test because thyroid hyperthyroidism can also lead to this. Next, please. And they can also guide our future therapy. So apart from these basic tests, now we have to go on to do an echocardiography in all these patients. It is the key investigation for the assessment of the cardiac function because it measures the left ventricular ejection fraction and then we can categorize our patients into HFREF, HFF, or HFMEF. Then we need a chest X-ray from two points of view. First, to rule out a pulmonary cause of the breathlessness, we may rule out a pneumonia, a pleural fusion, or pulmonary artery hypertension. And in heart failure, you may find pulmonary congestion or cardiomegaly. Next. So this diagram beautifully shows the algorithm for heart failure according to ESC 2021 guidelines. And this is when a patient comes to us with symptoms and signs suggestive of heart failure, that is breathlessness, orthopnea, or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and with an abnormal ECG. What should we do first? If the facility is available, we should get natriuretic peptides. If the anti pro NVP is more than 125 or BNP is more than 35, I think we should go on to next step that is echocardiography. Or if this is not available or we are suspecting heart failure, straight away we can go to echocardiography. If it is abnormal, we have to categorize our patients as I told you. If it is ejection fraction less than 40%, we will call it HFREF. If it is between 41 to 49, it is called, now it is the, uh, the terminology has been changed. It is now HP my MRF. And if it is more than 50, we call it HFF. That is with a preserved ejection fraction. Next, please. 
what if a new patient of heart failure comes to us how will you work it out again when a patient comes to us with sudden breathlessness more on lying down we should take a proper history find out the risk factor in that patient whether it is hypertensive diabetes or history of any ischemic heart disease and then we will do these following test ecg do a pulse oximetry echocardiogram chest x ray and other evaluation and then go for a natriuretic peptide testing if the bnp is less than 100 and nt pro nb less than 300 mr pro np is less than 120 i think the chances of acute heart failure are almost ruled out but if these figures are high bnp is more than 100 nt pro bnp more than 300 and mr pro b in uh, anp is more than 120 chances are that it is acute heart failure and you treat that patient accordingly after doing the echocardiography i think so that i think that sums it all we need to have the symptoms signs suggestive of heart failure and this has to be supplemented by natriuretic peptide testing ecg chest x ray and of course echogram which remains the cornerstone of diagnosis next please thank you very much sir uh, for the wonderful uh, exposition and from from his beautiful uh, talk uh, we we have to understand that medicine is an art we have to suspect heart failure because many a times if the doctors do not suspect they will not look for it and you would have seen from his uh, the flow chart that these are not very expensive investigations even echo is not a very expensive investigation antiprobin p is not a very expensive investigation and they should be part of that because each hospitalization for heart failure people have to spend lakhs of rupees and not only that each hospitalization will take away not only the quality of life many years of life from the patient that brings us to the next question because uh, dr kohli has mentioned from the guidelines that nt pro bnp is recommended prior to a co what is your view regarding the same so i would put forth my views and uh, first of all it's like in india nt pro bnp safety not done enough it partly is because of non availability but it is not a very expensive investigation and uh, uh, like uh, many places the cost is somewhere between 500 uh, uh 500 ish and uh, uh it's available but we don't ask for it that is the most important thing and it, it gives us a good clue because sometimes another important point is that patient may come with an echo some time back it may show an ejection fraction say 55 or 60 and he has got breathlessness and uh, sometimes we may not even repeat but then nt pro bnp may give a clue especially in mildly reduced and half your preferred ejection fraction it clinches the diagnosis so the the esc guidelines are very clear and look at the level of class of recommendation for nt pro bnp 1b and it is even slightly higher than transthoracic echo and even 20 ecg because these are patients with heart failure this is not patient with chest pain and uh, here antiprobin is very important because it can diagnose it can prognosticate and it can differentiate and maybe it will give us a clue in phenotyping also so the they have recommended nitro nitro peptides as initial diagnostic test and it's as i said before it's good for prognostication and it may guide further cardiac investigation and as dr kohli beautifully said if it is quite low we can even rule out uh, uh, acute heart failure sometimes we have people with low ejection fraction coming with breathlessness or we is especially this winter months and they would be like treated with high dose of diuretics but if somebody checks the antipro bnp it may be low and then it will give a clue again See, even the person who was prior diagnosed have heart failure the acute deterioration may be due to something else it may be due to sepsis may be due to copd asthma 
all those things it will give us a clue and most important is anti pro bnp because it is not affected by uh, the other uh, drugs like vasopressin sacubitril anti remember like uh, two values 125 and 300 if it is anti pro bnp more than 125 in non acute setting acute setting more than 300 it gives us a clue it is not sacrosanct it will the anemia renal failure other things also can have but it will give us a clue and echo establishes since it finally it divides you can divide it into multiple categories but anti pro bnp is also important and so as a uh, the person who is more bullish and being part of a lot of clinical trials in heart failure and i my clinical interest in heart failure i use anti pro bnp very commonly but indian scenario is little different because even the random heart failure registry and other registry data is sadly underused and echo like we actually anti pro bnp more be more available but Uh, we rely more on echo echo is important and echo is there even now in small and remote centers so my advice or my take would be is use use it uh in a balanced way and in the pro bnp is underutilized and echo may be sometimes overutilized you see a year of 50% then we don't think about heart failure at all it's also wrong so with that i will ask the next question the endocrine colleague dr altama shake what are the challenges in diagnosing heart failure in patients with diabetes sure thank you for that question good afternoon everyone i agree with my previous both these speakers and our moderator of course so what is more important is three things when it comes to heart failure and diabetes the time that we catch these patients we need to get these uh, things early in time early in when they present maybe even before that in some patients the second thing that is very important is the testing and the values of some markers which we have seen in earlier slides and i'll show you some more in detail and number 3 would be what treatment strategies that we would be taking into so importantly each of these whether it's just diabetes or the heart failure each of these entity independently increase the risk of each other and at times they may be just concomitant four times more in women for fall increase of heart failure risk with diabetes and prevalence also of heart failure four times more is there not only this as diabetes we are seeing in younger population even the risk of heart failure it may be associated with in this population also and as for each complication of diabetes whether it's retinopathy neuropathy or a stroke or an mi or atherosclerosis we also have that each 1% increase in glycated hemoglobin will increase the risk of incident heart failure by around 36% which is quite a huge number to look at and i think we need to not just catch the people with diabetes early but also of these abnormalities like heart failure early and we we are learning the screening test in about how we have the earlier two speakers have shown what happens when there is a subclinical cardiac abnormality in patients with diabetes so whether it is an age related issue whether it's a calcium handling issue or whether it's a fatty acid utilization it's a mechanistic it's a pathophysiology that we are looking towards is it is it really an autonomic dysfunction over there with a ras activation or is it an inflammatory dyslipidemic endothelial dysfunction which is causing coronary artery disease and that may cause an ischemic cardiomyopathy and the rest may cause a diabetic cardiomyopathy through fibrosis and all the pathways finally then leading to heart failure in diabetes also the presence of each of these abnormalities as we see in this particular graph of pathophysiology is associated with a symptomatic heart failure and mortality and that's that's the death of the particular patient which we do not want to happen suddenly patients without symptomatic heart failure often have subclinical abnormalities and these changes may include when you see on a 2d echo it could be a lv dysfunction it could be a lv mass increase it could be relative wall thickness on a 2d echo left atrial size it could be a diastolic dysfunction or an increase in extracellular volume or a fraction these are those abnormalities that actually cause 
these mechanistic issues towards heart failure and that's the reason i think we've been harping upon that it is the early diagnosis of heart failure in diabetes which is very very critical and that was my first point that i started talking about in the next slide we will show you that yes it is early diagnosis that's very important and immediate treatment can help the patient with delay or prevent the progression of this debilitating combo because the high prevalence and significant morbidity and mortality of heart failure actually tells us that it's a compulsory thing it mandates to have an early identification maybe before time for appropriate therapy moreover most of the clinicians should not overlook diabetes patients with stable coronary heart disease that's an important warning underlining or a red flag that the stable patients if they present with atypical symptom they should also be picked up that's a very very important line recently the eac also has given chest pains as one of the short forms about how do you deal with these kind of uh, symptom and i think atypical instead of atypical they say use the word non cardiac uh, chest pain and also importantly 50% of people with left ventricular systolic dysfunction may have an antecedent to heart failure remain undiagnosed and untreated similarly we have the way we have 50% of people of diabetes remain undiagnosed for a long long time till we have a screening test or we till we have a age related screening based where then the data is upcoming so early diagnosis what are the component or challenges in diagnosis of heart failure in diabetes again two important things detection of abnormalities in the myocardium exclude cardiomyopathy other causes which could be contributory these are two important clinical uh, pearls that need to be looked into and also if you have lack of sign and symptom at an early stage from a clinical challenge point of view and lack of any pathognomonic histologic challenges or changes or imaging characteristics which are associated with the diagnosis so importantly diagnosing diabetes heart failure in patients of diabetes require further testing and i'm going to give two pearls again one a clinical careful history will detect the symptom what would you look into already my previous speaker has shown but i'll show you in one of the next slides the dyspnea on effort or thopnea nocturnal cough or wheezing easy fatigability and nocturia should be taken into consideration but in 20% of those with ejection fraction of less than 40 do not report any symptom and physical examination no matter how skilled the examiner is may not show signs of heart failure that's again a very important line no matter how skilled the examiner may be this is because we are stressing upon this point because it is humanly possible that even the best of the years or the sets may not be able to that's why we may we may need a biochemical or an image to support the diagnosis at times as we saw in the slides that's why further testing and importantly the eac guideline also talk about that does not have any specific recommendation but look into the metabolic cause look into the metabolic abnormality which could be kind of a hyperthyroidism presenting with this which could be a pheochromocytoma presenting with a cardiomyopathy it could be a corn syndrome of uh, hypokalemia and high uh, renin aldosterone mechanism it could be there or it could be a cushing syndrome presenting with diabetes and and heart failure so we need to have a widen uh, spectrum we need to think out of the box we need to have investigations beyond the box of routine diabetes and heart failure when it comes to examples of presentation of endocrine diseases and importantly i think i would like to end by showing two more slides wherein our own associations of physicians of india have recommended an approach of heart failure in type 2 diabetes look into the history and physical examination which is stressed upon by almost all the guidelines investigations of serial assessment of resting ecg urine albumin creatinine ratio and egfr which all of us are doing it nearly in our clinics daily and should be considered in all the patients to help predict the risk of developing heart failure evaluate nt pro bnp which should be considered to assess the probability of heart failure wherever possible and of course confirm the diagnosis by a 2d echography also to be done as a kind of an investigation to establish an approach to the diagnosis and in one of my last slides i'm going to show you now how the api has given us with a routine 
criteria of clinical ECG and biochemical albuminuria. If there is no assessment which suggests of heart failure, heart failure may be unlikely. However, if there is more than one assessment suggestive of heart failure risk, then we should do a BNP. Here, the value they've quoted is around more than 125 picogram per ml. If it is not beyond that, again, heart failure is unlikely. But however, if it is present, then echocardiography to be done. And if that shows the signs of heart failure, then we treat accordingly in those lines. If not, if it is normal, then again, heart failure is unlikely. It's quite an eased out uh, statement and algorithm given by uh, the API. And I think I would like to stop uh, here and give it over to our moderator, Dr. Uman. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful talk. And uh, it's important to identify early. And as was mentioned, like patient may deny symptoms, but when you go in depth, they'll say that, okay, I was walking five kilometers before, now I'm walking two kilometers. That also can, may be considered as a symptom. And most important take home from this, uh, this so far is that mild symptoms do not, in heart failure, is not equivalent to mild disease because class two or class one patients also die, but 10% of them may deteriorate annually. And in one third of them, the first event may be sudden death. So mild symptoms is not mild disease. There is no mild cancer. There is no mild breast cancer or mild uh, uh, lung cancer. Similarly, cardiac failure has got higher mortality than most cancers, except for lung cancer. It has got higher mortality. So we should chase it aggressively, find it and treat it. So that comes to the next question. What are the general principles of pharmacotherapy in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? The answer is very simple. Like for why do we treat as, card, as doctors? We have want to improve the quality of life, quantity of life, or both. But in heart failure, is there anything more? First part is very clear, reduction in mortality. Second part is prevention of recurrent hospitalization due to worsening heart failure and improvement in clinical status, that is functional capacity, quality of life. There is something more here, reduction in mortality, which includes sudden death. Because sudden cardiac death is common in diabetics. You might have seen patients who have come for your review. Patient was doing fine. He might have had a bypass or angioplasty, but overall, everybody would have patted their shoulders and said, you're doing well. Next is the relative would come and say, he suddenly died. Because patients with heart failure and, uh, and also diabetes can die suddenly. And sudden cardiac death is more common in patients with minimal or no symptoms. And that is very important. So what are the guidelines? What does the guideline recommend? They recommend modulation of renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system and sympathetic nervous system and ACE inhibitors or RNAs. ACE inhibitors have been there for a long time. Beta blockers have been there for more than nearly 60 now, maybe 60 years. But the heart failure aspect came only in the late 80s. MRS still there, very much there. The final act one is quite cheap. And they are the general foundations of pharmacotherapy. And we, when we talk about RNA, it's like, it's like, uh, angiotensin receptor applies an inhibitor. It's a cornerstone therapy because, very simply because on top of standard therapy, it showed a further 20% benefit. And that is humongous because we, like, uh, in spite of a lot of advances, our rate of improvement in the prognosis of patients with heart failure has not been very optimal. But last five years have been tremendously good because we have RNAs, we have SGL2 inhibitors. And according to ESC, the triad of cornerstone therapies RNAs, beta blockers, and MRS, and with SGL2 inhibitors, both DAPA and MPA, a class one indication form the foundational therapy. So the management algorithm is uh, the RNAs or ACE inhibitors, but we have 
we know from data that uh, the uh, on on in patients like against ACE inhibitors or enlapril ARNI scored in both mortality, morbidity, quality of life, and beta blockers, MRA, DAPA, and MPA, if there is congestion, you have diuretics. And this is very important. Somebody is not congested. Somebody says he's not very much breathless. There's no evidence of congestion. There's no RARs. Then diuretics, uh, especially loop diuretics, may not be of great benefit. And sometimes they will cause little harm also. But MRAs are of benefit. And EF of less than 35, QR is less than 130 milliseconds, and especially ischemic <coughs> implantable cardioverter defibrillator is very important. Another very under uh, uh, recommended uh, modality in our country, in less than only less than 5% are recommended who, are, who really need it. That's very, very important. And if your QRS is more and if it's less than 35% CRT, it's more costlier, but very, very, very uh, great effect. So fundamentally, foundational therapies are four, the major three plus uh, HD2 inhibitors, ICDs and ICD implantable cardioverter defibrillator and CRTs wherever appropriate. So that is the very simple, like uh, already it's been said, look at jet infraction, look at the NT-Pro BNP, then EF less than 35, look at the QRS duration, less than 130, and especially majority ischemic, think of ICD also. Otherwise, the foundational therapy is on foundational therapy. So now I would uh, pass on the baton to Dr. Kohli. He would uh, answer the important question. In a, a patient with HFRF, without diabetes, because there is always that subset, which therapies without diabetes, which therapies are recommended as an uh, internal medicine specialist? Dr. Kohli, please. Thank you, Dr. Abraham. I think Dr. Altama has already pointed out that diabetes, it is the diabetes who are more prone to heart failure two to four times. Not only that, they get more heart failure, but they are more likely to die of heart failure. It is not that the non-diabetic do not get high heart failure. There is still a lot of uh, non-diabetics who go into heart failure. And as Dr. Abraham has already pointed out, what we are looking for is a drug which should have three aims. It should be able to prevent the mortality because of heart failure, number one. Number two, it should prevent readmissions in a case of heart failure. And third, it should improve the quality of the life of the patient. And we have been using these three group of drugs, ACE or ARBs, beta blockers and MRAs for many years. But in spite of that, we have not been able to address to these three problems. We have not been able to reduce the mortality. We have not been able to improve the quality of the patient. And we have not been able to stem the repeated hospitalization in heart failure. But now you can see ACE inhibitor slash ARNI. So ARNI is a drug which has brought about this revolution of addressing to all, all these three problems. Next, please. And up, after ARNI comes the SGLT2 inhibitors. And we have got ample evidence from DEPA-HF trial and declared to me trial that DEPA-glyphosine and empaglyphosine, when added to these three drugs, further reduces the risk of CV death and worsening heart failure in these patients. And the new DEPA-HF trial has shown that this benefit is seen not only in diabetic population, but this is also seen in non-diabetic population. And another heartening feature from that trial was the benefit was seen as early as 28 days of starting the treatment. So you get the benefit at that too very early. So now the SGLD2 inhibitors are also added to the uh, therapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fashion patients. Next, please. So apart from these four drugs, ARNI, beta blockers, MS, MRAs, and SGLD2 inhibitors, there is scope for some other drugs also. 
but they are used when the situation demands. For example, as Dr. Abraham has showed, the use of loop diuretics. Yes, loop diuretics can be used in those patients of HFREP with who show symptoms of congestion or symptoms of overflow. There is a pedal edema. There are a lot of repetitions. Yes, you can use the loop diuretics. But a word, a word of caution here is because we are using also ARNI. So adding loop diuretics may precipitate hypotension. So just take care of the blood pressure in these patients. Then what about the ARBs? ARB has a place provided the patient cannot tolerate ACE or ARNI, then use ARB in place of these two drugs. But ARNI remains the first drug of choice. Then third drug is evabradin. Evabradin have come when, because we want in a patient of heart failure, the heart rate to be below 70. If in spite of the beta blocker, the maximum tolerated dose of beta blockers, the heart rate of the patient remains over 70. I think it is worthwhile trying evabradin in these patients. Or if the patient, the beta blockers are contraindicated, then you can also use evabradin in place of beta blockers. Then they have mentioned it is new drug that is very sequent, which is a pulmonary artery dilator. It is not available in India, so no point in talking about that. Next, please. Then, if the patient does not get relief, a patient is still symptomatic after giving adequate doses of RNA, ACE, or ARB, you can add isosarbide dinitrate. And lastly, what is the role of digoxin? Digoxin has been used for ages, but now I think it has fallen out of grace. It is not used, but still it has got a place. You can worth consider it in patients of symptomatic of HFREP patients who are in sinus rhythm despite treatment with ARNI beta blocker and MRA. So if all these three drugs, in spite of them, the patient remains symptomatic, we can also try digoxin. And of course, when the ejection fraction is too low, you can go to the devices also. Next, please. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Khalid, for that wonderful information. Now, the other side of the coin, HFRF patients with diabetes, which therapies, what are recommended? I request Dr. Altamash to take the, uh, the takeover. Thank you, sir. Again, I think this is going to be the one slide which you will see from all the three speakers, wherein the ESC has suggested the treatment whether it's the patient with diabetes or without diabetes, we've got actually three main molecule for the HFREF, a triad of ACE inhibitor, ARNI beta blocker, and MRA mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. That is the that is going to remain the cornerstone. We heard very, very elegantly from our previous speaker about non-diabetic, but when it comes to diabetes, I think we all have suddenly been harping upon one particular drug, a class of drug, which I think we are using it nearly day in and day out with, of course, with certain amount of patient education that needs to be given with that. And that's the S3 LT2 inhibitor class of drug. And that is where even the ESC 2021 recommendation recommends about the same thing. Now, you have seen some earlier slides uh, wherein uh, I think the doctor showed about the class one recommendation, class 2A and uh, around class 2B and level of evidence was C, B and uh, so on. But I think now what we have these classes of drug which are going to be class one and the level of evidence which is going to be around A. So we have canagliflozin as one of the uh, molecules that is present in our armamentarium and it is very much present in India. We've been using it since 2015. Dapagliflozin, of course, very widely available. Empagliflozin or two very, very much on the edge that would hit uh, uh, the borders and would come very soon to us. Sotagliflozin are recommended to prevent heart failure and CV death in patients with type 2 diabetes. Wherein it, when it comes to specially molecules like dapagliflozin and empagliflozin, they are also indicated for this particular treatment. And we've had, we have nearly little more data with these two molecules of DAPA as well as empagliflozin, which has been just pouring and coming with recent uh, releases of trials, which came in any dream also. 
And as we see in this particular slide, that in patients with type 2 diabetes at risk of CV events to reduce the risk of hospitalization, major CV events and stage renal dysfunction and CV death, that's the level of evidence A with a class one recommendation. And when it comes to patients with type two with HFREF to reduce again the HHF and CV death, the recommended ones with the ESC 2021 are DAPA, EMPA and Sotagliflozin. In this particular category, uh, the data for uh, for Kana and DAPA and uh, to are a little lesser. Class one and A evidence is much better for the DAPA, EMPA and SOTA as we see over here. So I think with this, I would again hand the session over to the uh, moderator, Dr. Ruman. Thank you very much. And uh, this would be the final part. Uh, what would be the cardiologist opinion regarding ACC 21 consensus and ACC ESC 2021 guidelines. There is some difference between consensus statement that is few people sit together and also uh, it is not a guideline. Guidelines are stronger. But having said that, guidelines are also not written in stone. We'll have to use our common sense and the art of medicine to get the maximize the benefit to our patient. So what did the ESC 2021 guidelines say? Bad. AC bar AR, ARNI, beta blocker, MRA. Then they very clearly said ARNI may be considered as first line therapy instead of AC inhibitors. ARBs are only people with or, or cannot tolerate AC inhibitors, ARB alone. Then SDL2 inhibitors are recommended in addition to uh, optimal medical therapy with AC bar ARNI, beta blocker, and an MRA. ACC 2021. Again, they highlighted ARNI preferred. They highlighted about evidence-based beta blocker and diuretic as needed when if there is congestion. And uh, they also said beta blockers are better, tol better tolerated when the patient is dry. Things like when the patient is having rals or uh, lungs are wet, so patient may not tolerate. But ARNI, the pioneer study has shown early initiation of ARNI is very good, so the direct to ARNI approach is recommended, and SDL2 inhibitor can be added to the core HFREF therapy. So the ESC guidelines said initiation of valsatan cyclobutylene AC inhibitor naive. That means you need not have a trial of ARBs or AC inhibitors before starting ARNI. You can straight away start ARNI. And ACC 2021 said the same thing directly initiating ARNI rather than pre-treatment with AC or ARB. And you should titrate uh, blood pressure, electrolytes, and renal function. So the mantra is uh, go slow, start low, and aim high. So start low, go slow, and aim high. We just start, and they, we do not titrate upwards, also may not be good. And uh, again, the ESC said about patients hospitalized with heart failure, the, the, they say that patients should be uh, carefully evaluated to exclude persistent congestion before discharge and optimize oral treatment. This is because if patient has got congestion at discharge, very highly likely that they may come back for re-hospitalization or come back dead. And evidence-based oral medical therapy should be administered before discharge. is a very important concept because we start, it has been very clearly shown that if we start during hospitalization or early if it's outpatient, early during the outpatient visits, the patient and doctor inertia will not be there and patients will be on continued medications. And an early follow-up at one to two weeks is also important because many times you ask them to come after two months, three months, but when you start these medicines, ask them to come at one to two weeks and if you cannot personally do even the time of uh, what do you call telemedicine, we can do use that. And initiation of RNA in hospitalized patient is safe. ACC 2021 consensus, the very clearly says that the ideal time for therapy optimization is during hospitalization. That is the golden period. And subsequently titrated up. So the patient, as there are many kinds of patients, Dino, Hefrof patients, which is seen 
mostly by the primary care physicians and their uh, 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 counterparts and uh, hospitalized health ref, both internal medicine specialists, the cardiologists see, diabetologists see as references and uh, ambulatory chronic health ref patient by seeing everybody. And this is a preferred choice both by ESC and ACC. And what do these drugs do? They reduce natural peptide and plasma levels, that especially ARNI, uh, reduce symptoms and NIHI class, reduce the need of diuretic dose, improve the quality of life and functional capacity, decrease heart failure-related hospitalization, reduce hospital heart failure-related death, reduce sudden cardiac death, reduce mortality for all causes, reduce LV volumes, and increase LV ejection fraction. This is what ARNI does. And ARNI does it arguably better than the other, or as good, or arguably better than the other foundational therapy. We have, we have very low threshold in starting ACE inhibitors, but the paradigm study has shown that for each point, ARNI was superior. So we should not be uh, denying our patients. And since this is a, a diabetology endocrine meeting, I took a very recent paper from November 3rd, 2021, and they look, this, this article said about the potential mechanism of uh, valsartans acubital on glycemic control. So we are talking about heart failure, but again, on glycemic control also, <coughs> because there were many things, type of mechanisms include increased lipid mobilization and mobilization from adipose tissue, increased postprandial lipid oxidation, increase adiponectin synthesis, improves insulin sensitivity, increase insulin secretion, reduction of hunger and food intake, and improved insulin sensitivity, pathophysiology, and the effect may be, there may be increased natural peptide activity due to nitroplasin uh, acts in the first three, and increased glucagon-like peptide one activity, again, has been effect on secretion, insulin secretion, in, in insulin sensitivity, hunger, and food protein. This is a very famous slide from the cardiology circles. So when we look at hard endpoints, what is the hardest endpoint? What are, what are the only two absolutes in life? They are death, taxes, and maybe change. Many of us are very resistant to change, but death and taxes are absolute. So, and so we let's talk about mortality. Let's remove everything else from the equation because we have we, everyone wants to live longer. And you can see here relative reduction of two-year mortality. Look at the effect. And ARNI is on top of ACE or RB or replacing ACE or RB or on patients or compared to patients on ACE or IRB. And when you give all four together, the absolute risk reduction is about 26%. And number needed to treat is 3.9 or 4. There is no therapy, group of therapies in the world in, in our cardiology or in other specialities will give this much benefit in mortality and a disease where, as Dr. Coley said, five-year mortality is 50% or more than most cancer. And this was shown in the tandem heart failure registry that only one out of six patients received guideline-directed therapy, and they were associated with higher uh, mortality and lesser survival. And when do we start them? Now the concept of cardiologists, we talk about door to balloon. Some people talk about Aghanadan and group. And they looked at patients who were initiated on ARNI plus beta blocker plus MRI plus HGLD2 versus standard AC or ARB versus beta blockers. And this was very famous. But certain authors, some people try to reverse engineer it and thought, what is the harm in not giving it? What is the benefit in giving it? And what is the harm in not giving it? Benefit, reduce cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization by 62%, reduce cardiovascular death by 50%, reduce all-cause mortality by 47%, extend your patient's median survival by 6.3 years. Now, let's look here. If you do not give these four, and we just give AC or B, AC or ARB plus beta blockers. What is actually happening? 
we increase compared to four fourth run foundation of therapy we increase cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization by 163% increase cardiovascular death risk by 100% increase all cause mortality by 89% shorten your patient's median survival by 6.3 years ladies and gentlemen we all take an oath first like to save the lives of the patient and by doing less we may be doing uh, harm and we have taken note first do no harm so we should do uh, uh, the foundation therapy that patient will live longer so this is my last slide uh, the time is essential so right choice in drug guideline directed therapy is important arne is important and is good for diabetic patients also here i will stop sharing the slide and i would request dr kohli we have two more minutes left one minute so give his summary after that one minute for dr altamarch to give your final summary dr kohli please yes thank you dr abraham i think these two drugs arni and sgl2 inhibitors have changed they are the wonder drugs of this decade i think they have changed the way we treat diabetes and heart failure second thing i want to say is that i have been treating my patients of heart failure with arni for a long time now i think more than 200 patients i have got right now one point one uh, caution to my physician colleagues and that is no matter what lower dose patient a uh, lower dose of arni patients can tolerate they still gives you benefit so don't bother if you don't reach the target dose of 200 mg twice a day even if you reach 100 mg twice a day it will do some benefit to the patient and secondly my message to my colleagues is that don't stop the drug arni because once the ejection fraction increases i have seen increasing from 25 to 40% the patients and even the physician tend to stop the arni once you stop the arni i think it will come back again down so you have to give this arni benefit to all your patients of heart failure i think like i think I think that is my message. Thank you, Dr. Altamash. Sure. So I think I would like to say that this is uh, one aspect of diabetes and heart failure where we should start slow, stay low, avoid in patients who do no shows because these drugs need to be monitored, especially when they're giving a combination of Arni and SGLT2. Look into creatinine and hyperkalemia. Going over there, most importantly, do not. skip it you we need to look for heart failure atypical symptoms and signs time is essential and over to you thank you thank you very much we are absolutely on time thank you for dr kohli as well as dr altamarsh my i'll sign off with one sentence from one trial prove hf where patients treated with arni over a period of 12 months 62% of the patients improved over more the year improved to more than 35% that is the cutoff for icd so it has dr kohli said it saves lives ef improves and if you do not give them we may not be doing justice to the patient thank you very much for patient hearing thank you very much thank you